bring your Bibles up to one of the Lord's half-brothers, the book of James. James chapter 1, my message is entitled, Are You a Self-Deceiver? Beloved, I want you to pay close attention to you this morning. Uh, It's really supposed to be an encouraging message, but it's something that's extremely needful seeing what's going on in Christendom in this last generation. So uh, just follow along. Let the Holy Ghost uh, minister to you. Are you a self-deceiver? I didn't say, are you deceiving someone else? I said, are you a self-deceiver? James chapter 1. Let's all stand up, please, for the reading of God's Word. James says, beginning with verse 21, he says, Wherefore, remember when there's a therefore or wherefore, you look around and see what it's there for, in light of everything I've been saying, He's saying, wherefore, lay apart all filthiness. He's speaking about moral filthiness or immorality and superfluity of naughtiness, that superabundance of moral and spiritual evil and wickedness and worldliness. It's just a fancy KJV word, uh, superfluity of naughtiness. And receive the word with meekness. uh, Receive uh, with meekness the engrafted. That word engrafted means the implanted seed of the word of God which is able to save your souls. That is, if you do this. If you don't, it won't. It's able to if you do this. Amen? Verse 22, But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. You're not deceiving God. You're deceiving your own self. It goes on and says, For if any man be a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. Now, of course, that word glass means mirror. For he beholdeth himself, and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, notice what he says, and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. That is, this man, who doesn't just behold, but continues, and he keeps looking into the Word. Amen? Are you a self-deceiver? Our Father and our God, we've come to the serious part of the service where the infallible, eternal Word of God is being preached. Oh, Holy Spirit, I pray that you'd open up the eyes of our understanding, open our minds up, indelibly stamp these truths in our lives. Where we need to change, change us. Where we need to repent, help us repent. Where we need to correct ourselves, oh God, you say you resist the proud, but you give grace unto the humble. Father, anoint this preacher with feet of clay. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, beloved, my text for this morning is verse 22. But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only. He says, receiving your own selves. I want to speak to you this morning on this little phrase, receiving your own selves. I want to ask you, are you a type of person that always tells yourself what you want to hear to justify your action or what you really need to hear. You're ruthlessly honest with yourself. You admit your strengths. You admit your weaknesses. You admit where you need improvements. Or are you always deceiving yourselves? Now the old adage certainly rings true. The worst deception in life is self-deception. In fact, the Bible calls it a person that's always self-deceiving themselves. The Bible calls that person a fool. Can you imagine that? That's not me. That's the Lord that says that. A person who is a self-deceiver is a fool in the sight of God, and he's a fool to himself. Now, the Bible repeatedly warns us about being deception and deceivers in the last days. And indeed, beloved, in uh, 2 Timothy 3, verses 1 through 12, Paul warns us about the coming perilous times. He says, this know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. And he goes on and he explains it, but he's talking about the apostasy that's going to be in the church. But in verse 13, beloved, he also warns us, listen to what he says. He says, but evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse. Now listen to what he says. Deceiving, that is deceiving others, being deceived. As we narrow down to the second advent, God says deception is going to be rampant. But especially self-deception. People that are deceiving themselves. 
He's saying not only will multitudes of folks within the walls of the corporate church and Christendom, uh, uh, beloved, will be morally and spiritually deceived by these evil men, by these deceivers, by these seducers. But he says also that moral and spiritual self-deception is going to run rampant amongst God professing people like a pandemic, like an epidemic that there's no cure for that sweeps right through multitudes and multitudes of people. Now, those are the words of the Lord. And Pastor Joel is just repeating what God has to say. And beloved, listen to me. Then, as in the case of the judges, those who claim to be God's people will now casually and cavalierly disregard. They will dismiss, disobey God's word, and they'll do what's right in their own eyes, even though they know God says it is not true. But they'll do it anyways. Because they are what? Self-deceivers. They know what God has to say, but they say, no, I've got my own way of doing it. And so God warns, this is what's coming upon the church in the last days. And so, beloved, this is the self-deception that the Apostle Paul and James here are speaking about. Now that word self-deception, imautu planao, is the Greek word, has a plethora of meanings according to both the Bible and also Christian theologians and psychiatrists. And I'm talking about Christian psychiatrists who know the Word of God, who don't just take some Freudian or Jung philosophy and then try to find a scripture and throw it to it. They know the principles and precepts of the Word of God. And these men are trained in science and they are trained in the Word of God. Would you say amen? So what does it mean? It means to purposely and willingly lead oneself astray from the truth into error. How? That's a good question, isn't it? How, Pastor Joel? By convincing yourself into now accepting what is true and right, that which you already personally and definitely know to indeed be false and wrong. Psychiatrists tell us that self-deception is self-betrayal. To me, self-deception is knowingly lying to yourself, self, but still trying to convince and persuade yourself that it's true when you know all the time, intuitively in your heart, because God has given you a conscience, you've got the mirror of the Word of God, yet you know it's not true, but you're trying to make it true in your life. That, my friends, is being a self-deceiver. Would you say amen out there? You see, beloved, self-deception is biased and willful thinking based upon this. Now listen to me. Your own subjective feelings and not the objective facts that you already know are true and disproves your baseless beliefs. When I was a private investigator, I used to have to go to court all the time. I always made sure I had my notes, and my notes were based with facts. When I was cross-examined, and they always try to put your feet in the fire, I'd always say, Your Honor, could I have a copy of my notes, please? The investigator, upon arriving on the scene, noticed the assailant appeared to be favoring his left lower limb. You know why it's like that? Because he said, are you a doctor? How do you know he was? He appeared to be. I don't know if he really was, okay? But he appeared to be. He had a little bump and limp to him. But you see, beloved, it was always based on the facts. It wasn't based upon what I thought. It wasn't my subjective feeling. And this is what a self-deceiver does. His own or her own feelings are what deceiving them all of the time. Beloved, self-deception is the intentional, interpersonal phenomenon of using your own dishonest deceit to try to deny and rationalize away the relevance and importance of the verifiable and factual evidence that opposes your thesis to what you say you claim to believe. I know what the facts are, but don't bother me with it. Well, you're not going to get very far in life like that, are you? What am I saying to you? I'm saying this self-deception is you trying to deny in yourself that which you know, you know is right and true, but you don't want to admit it lest it convict you and force you to now have to change your ways and change your thinking. And that is hard. You know, we've all became Christians. Did you have to relearn how to think? That's what Romans 12, 1 is all about. I beseech thee therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God that present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is a reasonable service, and be not conformed to this world, but be transformed, how? By the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what that is good and perfect and acceptable will of God. Renewing our mind. Okay, that's junk. Shh, out. I need to delete that. This is true. I need to implant it. Amen. I need to reprogram myself. 
You see, I'm saying the self-deception is you trying to convince yourself that if you don't think about either the problem, if you don't think about the error of your ways, and you can push these thoughts and feelings out of your heart and mind, then given enough time, the consequences of them will all just go away and you won't have to deal with them. Amen? A lot of people think that. If I just don't deal with it, if I give it enough time, it's all going to go away. Beloved, listen to me. You will always reap what you sow. That is the law of reciprocity that is built into the warp and woof of the world by Almighty God Himself. Amen? You reap what you sow. You may not be tomorrow. It may not be next week. It may not be next month or next year. But you eventually, it will come back to haunt you. Just ask anybody that really truly has PTSD and they will tell you uh, all about that. But beloved, listen to me. What am I really saying to you? I'm saying this. The self-deception is inwardly rooted in our own sinful fallen hearts, but it's further enhanced and encouraged and exacerbated outwardly by the devil and the demonic influence that he perpetrates upon us. If he can lead us in one direction like a guppy, beloved, then we'll stop following and following, and then he gives more deception, more deception. And a lot of times it appears as a blessing in your life. Why? That's to encourage you to go further into self-deception, isn't it? You see, beloved, the Bible says, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. Galatians 6, 7. For what a man soweth, that shall he also reap. He that soweth to his flesh shall reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. Amen? So I can deceive you, and I can deceive the other person, and I can deceive myself, but God says you cannot and you will not ever deceive me. Wouldn't you say amen out there? You see, beloved, God kind of sums up this uh, self-deception and this sinfulness in us by saying this in Jeremiah 17, 9 and 10. Listen to what he says. He says, the heart is deceitful above all things, and it's desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the hearts. I try the reins to give unto every man according to his works and according to the fruit of his doings. Can you imagine that? The heart is more deceitful than demons. The heart is more deceitful than Satan himself. You see, beloved, Satan can only tempt us. We have to do the rest of it, amen? We have to act on it. That's why our hearts, and he warns us. And that's why we have, oh, praise the Lord for this book that we have in front of us. It has never been proven false. Would you say out there? So I ask you, beloved, are you a self-deceiver when it comes to dealing with realities in your life? Now listen to me, look at me. I don't want you looking down at your Bible right now. I don't want you looking outside. I don't want you thinking about the roast in the oven. I don't want you picking your teeth. I want you listening to what the Holy Ghost has to say to you. This isn't for my benefit, beloved. I already know what the Word of God said. This is for your benefit, amen? Are you a spiritual deceiver when it comes to admitting some painful truth to yourself that you reluctantly ever hate to acknowledge in your life? Because if you do, that means you're going to have to change. Are you a self-deceiver when it comes to accepting the moral and spiritual truth and authority of God's word, will, and ways in your life, beloved? In other words, do you live in disobedience to God's word, but yet you still lie to yourself, hoping against hope, that it really doesn't mean what it says, that I'm going to be the one that gets away with it. I can keep doing what I want to do. You see, beloved, if that's you, then you are a self-deceiver. Why? Because if God's word is not true, then I can't trust it that I was born again. I can't trust that Jesus was the eternal Son of God. I can't trust that there's a heaven to gain or a hell to shun. Can you? Because this is the book that tells us all about these eternal realities. And if we could open up that spiritual realm and look into the eternal dimension, beloved, we'd see that there's angels and demons fighting to try to prevent us from hearing uh, or hearing this message. Amen? So, beloved, now James here continues or contrasts the hearers of the Word of God who think they're saved but really aren't, with the doers of the Word of God who really are. And he shows us that the decisive factor that distinguishes the difference between the two is self words, Doers have a living, active faith. It's called the obedience of faith in the Scripture. Whereas hearers have a dead faith. And beloved, listen to me. I'd rather just trust and believe and let's say... A lot of people don't believe what God says, and they're miserable. Why don't you try believing, and maybe something will change. You can't get any more miserable than you already are. 
right? <laughs> so just give it a shot. So what am I saying? I'm saying those who are hearers only are really self-deceivers, beloved. They have a dead faith, and they live in their own little fictional and fantasy world of pretense and make-believe that they've contrived in their own mind, and they try to convince themselves that it's true, but it's not. But listen to me, beloved. It's an imaginary world that they're living in. It is not reality. It's what they want to be reality, but it really isn't reality, is it? I'm amazed sometimes especially as a pastor, when people come up to me and they've just gotten saved and, and they well, God will take care of that, and yet they haven't been in the battle long enough to understand how and why and where God does things. And sometimes he allows things, sometimes he doesn't allow things, sometimes he does things immediately, sometimes he lets them triumph. And it's not as simple or gray or black and white as you think it is sometimes, is it? And especially as you study and know the Word of God. So they live in an imaginary world. And this world is filled with their own personal delusions and distortions. This world is filled with their own personal deceptions about the real state of their soul and salvation before God, beloved. And it's based solely upon their own personal preferences and feelings. It has no basis in the Word of God whatsoever. That's why the Church of Jesus Christ universally is in the apostasy that it's in that God warned about all through the Old Testament. This is what happened to Israel, didn't it? They went into a, only a little remnant, God said. out of the, He says, will the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea? Beloved, imagine the sand on the beaches. Countless billions and trillions and gazillions. But only a remnant shall be saved, he said. Why? Because it's easy to live in self-deception. We want it that way. Why? Because life is tough. And I'll tell you, the older you get, I'll tell you, being a senior citizen is no easy thing, right? You folks who are 27 like me, you know what I'm talking about. It's no easy thing when you have grown, when you've been used to doing things yourself and independent and had your strength and you could do what you wanted to do. And all of a sudden, from here up, you still want to do it. But the rest of you are saying, wait for me, wait for me. <laughs> you see, beloved, what am I saying to you? I'm saying it has no basis in either reality or Scripture. And therefore, it's spiritually and eternally dangerous, and it's deadly and it's damning. Now, conversely, the doers of the Word of God, beloved, who have a dynamic faith that works, whose convictions and conduct, their beliefs and behavior, their soul and salvation is deeply rooted and embedded in the principles and precepts and promises found in both Scripture and reality, and therefore, through the obedience of uh, faith, it ensures and secures their eternal destiny and eternal life. Would you say amen out there? Amen. See, it's, I, I know what it is in whom I believe. Though he slay me, Job said, yet will I trust him. I'll trust his word. I'm not going to trust this fellow over here. I'm not going to trust the pundits over here. I'm not going to trust the naysayers over here. I will trust in what the infallible God himself says. Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Would you say amen? Though he slay me. And beloved, God has let many of his men and women, godly men and women, be slain. Amen? Stephen, the first daughter of the church, it took a slaying of a Stephen to save a Paul, the apostle Paul. And God allowed it. God, James, was slain with a sword by Herod. But yet God spared Peter, who was thrown in jail. Why? That's God's business, not mine. So don't have a simplistic view of the Word of God. Uh, that's where maturity comes in. Now I want you to look, if you would please, at verse 25a. The Bible says, But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein. Now the perfect law of liberty, what in the world is James talking about? Well, if we go to the book of James, it's easy to see, but let me give it to you in a synopsis, okay? The perfect law of liberty, beloved, refers to the whole, now listen to me, moral and spiritual law of God contained in the scriptures, but summed up by the Decalogue or the Ten Commandments and expounded by the gospel. Would you say amen out there? In other words, beloved, it refers to the whole Bible, the whole Word of God. In Psalm 19, 7, the Bible says this, that the law of God is perfect converting the soul. It's perfect to point to the righteousness of God. It's perfect to point out our unrighteousness in sin. 
and it's perfect to show us we need a Savior to drive us to the gospel. And Romans 1.16 says, Paul's talking, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the dunamis, the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes it, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. In other words, there's a priority in the midst of equality. So, beloved, I want to show you some truths here, if I can, this morning, if you'll allow me. First thing I want you to see is the character of self-deceivers. The character of self-deceivers. Look what he says in verse 22. He says, But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own self. Now, note the word deceiving, beloved. Parallogizomai. It is a present tense verb that shows constant and continuous action. And what does it mean, preacher? It means to regularly beguile yourself, to regularly delude and dupe yourself. It means to constantly and continuously fool and trick and cheat yourself through your own dishonest and deceitful wrong thinking and false reasoning when it comes to the scriptural and only way God says he's going to save your soul. God doesn't say he's going to save the soul the way Pastor Joel wants it to be done. If it was, beloved, I'd be out of the spiritual battle. I'd be a multimillionaire. I'd, have, I'd be working uh, 40 hours a week instead of 140. Well, there's 168 hours in a week, but a lot of hours, okay? Now, if I had my way, I'd be on easy street. That's the way I want to do it, and so wouldn't you. Amen? But that's not God's way. See, I have to change my thinking. I had to be reprogrammed. I had to change. And a lot of things that I learned... People say to me, what did you learn in college? I says, not much. What did you learn in seminary? Not much. Uh, see, I went to Holy Spirit University. Taught me a lot of things. <laughs> right? Seminary. I call it cemeteries. There are cemeteries today. What are you? I'm a Calvinist. Why? Because my seminary was a Calvinist. What are you? I'm an Arminius. Why? Because my seminary was Arminius. What are you? I'm a dispensationalist. Why? Because my seminary was a dispensationalist. You are by default. <laughs> right? But are you a biblicist? Are you a Christian? That's the question. Amen? So, beloved, in other words... The spiritual deceiver lies to himself by ignoring God's way of salvation through the obedience of faith and now substitute his own modified way of salvation just by listening and not doing God's word. A lot of people like to listen to God's word, but they don't want to what? They don't want to do God's word. In other words, beloved, he tricks himself into believing that just hearing the word of God constitutes and translates and doing the word of God and therefore this alone saves him. In other words, if I just sit in church long enough and I hear it all the preaching and the teaching, you know what? I'm going to be saved. Hey, listen to me. Romans 2.13 says this, it is not the hearers of the law who are just before God. It is what? The doers of the law who shall be justified in his sight because it shows you have an active faith. Not the hearers of the law. It's the what? The doers of the law. Now, there's three quick little, well, they're not quick little ones, but there's three sub-points I want you to see here, beloved. First thing I want you to do is see this. It's self-deceivers. They do hear the word. Look what he says in verse 23a. For if any be a hearer of the word. Now, the word hear here, akraates, means that at least these folks constantly and continuously listen to the Word of God as it's being read, as it's being taught, as it's being preached. They hear it through, or perhaps taught by their parents. They may hear it taught by their Sabbath school teacher. They may hear it taught by their pastor or preacher. Listen to me, Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 that God has chosen to save us. How? Through education. No, he didn't say that. How? By getting all kinds of degrees. No, he didn't say that. He said through the foolishness of preaching. Preaching what? Reader's Digest? No. Preaching what? Harvard Gazette? No. Preaching what? The infallible truth of the Word of God. Would you say amen? God has chosen through the foolishness of preaching to save us. Listen, it was preaching that converted the Roman Empire. It was con uh, preaching, beloved, of the Word of God that Western civilization was built upon. This country was built upon. The foolishness of preaching. Why? Because there's much more than just this man. I'm a fallible man and I'm nothing. I don't say that in self-deprecating myself. But I'm an instrument, just like a, a Stradivarius in the hands of a great violinist. 
You see, beloved, that instrument is not worth a hoot if the violinist doesn't know what he's doing. Amen? So God says he's going to save us through the foolishness of preaching, beloved. And they may also read the Bible occasionally, beloved. So intellectually and mentally, they hear the Word of God. They know what it has to say. And that's good. I'm glad they hear it. And I'm glad they know what they have to say. Problem is, we usually forget 80% of what we hear. Uh, but the fact is, they hear it. No, too, beloved, they don't heed the word. They hear the word, but they don't heed the word. Look what he says in verse 23b. He says, and not a doer. Let me stop you there. Here's the very root of their problem. They indeed hear the word of God, but they're not poietes. They're not doers or practitioners or performers of the word of God. In other words, beloved, they may hear the word, they agree with the word, but they don't act in it. It does not drop down from their ears in their mind, 18 inches down into their heart and outwardly into their life. See, they're hearing it intellectually. They have the capacity to be able to understand it. But it does not make deep root into their heart. The Bible says, listen to me now, that the Word of God is the seed that God sows in you. What is it? I've got a garden. And you know, and I tell you, Ellie and I have just had some nice kale. Oh, consola. Oh. She can make a silk purse out of a sow's ear. But, but you know, beloved, you have to sow the seed. And you have to water it. And you have to cultivate it. And then you, I went out with the scissors, and I said, don't pull it up, Ellie. This is cut and come again. She said, what do you mean? I said, snip a little here, snip a little there, leave some leaves for the photosynthesis so it can produce more leaves, and we can snip a little here, snip a little there. <laughs> we'll make it cut and come again, Ellie. But you see, beloved, that's the seed, the seed of the Word of God. God wants to go from your mind down into your heart. So they hear, they hear it, and they agree with it, but just hearing the Word of God produces only a transient and fleeting impression on their mind. What do you mean, Pastor? It produces only a momentary conviction of sin in them. It produces only a momentary sense of urgency in them. It produces only a momentary desire to want to obey God, to follow God, to serve God, whatever it may be. You see, it's fleeting. It comes across the screen of their mind. It goes in one, eye, one ear, one eye and out the other. One ear, and out the other ear. You see, what I'm saying, beloved, is this here. It passes quickly away, James says, as fast and as fleeting as a glance in the mirror does. Let me give it to you in the original Portuguese. As soon as they walk out of church. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's how fast. <laughs> Gone. As soon as they walk out from under the preaching and the teaching of the Word of God, I don't care what he has to say. Listen, you're not going to answer to me. I love you no matter what you do. But we will answer the God. Amen? So, beloved, I want you to look at verse 23c. The last part there. He says, like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. In other words, James equates the Word of God, the perfect law of liberty, to being like a physical mirror that we look into every day and reflects back our own true image, good, bad, or indifferent. Amen? Oh, but listen to me, beloved. The Word of God is the moral and spiritual mirror of absolute truth that God has provided to provide for the Christian to constantly, continuously look into. Why? Why does God do that? To reflect back to us our own true image before Him. To reflect back to us, beloved, so we can learn how to purge and purify our lives and perfect our lives. Why does God do that, beloved? To moral and spiritually save us and sanctify us to ensure that we're going to enter into the eternal kingdom of God and someday live in glory with our Abba Father forever. Would you say amen? You see, that's the mirror, the Word of God, the moral and spiritual mirror of absolute truth. That's what the Bible is. That's what the perfect law of liberty is that James is speaking about. Now, don't you miss this. Now, you hear me? Listen to me. Mirrors never lie to you. Mirrors never flatter you. Listen to me. A mirror will never beguile you. A mirror will always honestly tell you exactly what's going on. It will show you what's going on. Amen? Let me illustrate what I'm saying to you. 
For example, you can't blame the mirror for showing you that zit you got on the end of your nose. Now, you may not like it. You may go, hmm, and try to puff it. But the fact of the matter is that mirror has nothing to do with it. It's just reflecting back what you have. Beloved, you can't blame the mirror for showing you those wrinkles on your face. Listen to me. You can't blame the mirror for your graying hair or showing you that you're gaining weight. You cannot do that. It's only reflecting back to you the true image of what's already there so you can fix the problem. Now listen to me. You may not like the reflection of the image that you see in the mirror, but it's not the mirror's fault. And let me tell you something. The mirror is innocuous. <laughs> it doesn't have the power to fix your problem. You know, a lot of people like to try, and that's why they put all makeup. You know where the word cosmetics comes from? It comes from the Greek word cosmos. It means to make order out of chaos. That's true. <laughs> okay. <laughs> How do I fix my eyes? <laughs> okay. How do I get more color in my cheeks? Oh, that's not working. Some red paint. That rouge. I put my cheeks up. <laughs> what am I saying, dear beloved? I'm saying this. You can smash the mirror, but it won't get rid of your pimples. I'm saying, listen to me now, you can bang and crack the mirror, but it's not going to change the color of your hair. You can trash the mirror, but I assure you, you will not lose even one ounce of weight. Oh, how I wish you could. Amen. I wish we all could. Are you listening to me? The word of God and the perfect law of liberty is God's infallible and immutable mirror of truth that never lies to you, that never flatters you, that never beguiles you, that never betrays you. It is something that you can always trust as being absolutely true. Come on and say amen out there. So you can trust that as always being absolutely true. You see, God gave us this moral and spiritual mirror to convict us. And conviction is good. And God gave us this moral and spiritual mirror to convert us and consecrate us. That means make us holy. He gave us this moral and spiritual uh, mirror to change us, beloved, into the very image of the Lord Jesus Christ. But to achieve this end, then you must constantly and continuously hear the Word of God. You must constantly and continuously believe the Word of God. Read and study the Word of God. And especially do and obey the Word of God. Would you say amen? That is the obedience of faith, and that is how you avoid being a self-deceiver. You see, beloved, you must do it till it becomes a habitual practice in your life. Not like a, a self-deceiver who likes to hear the Word of God. He may read it, but he doesn't want to heed it, beloved. He don't want to look into that perfect law of liberty. Why? Because he has a dead faith. Oh, he has faith. Dead faith is a real faith. I may have a picture of my dead dad, and I'll never forget when my dad died. Uh, the guy that owned the funeral parlor was a, uh, a good friend of mine. And I said to him, I said, can I go in there and take some pictures? He says, go ahead, Joel. So I went in there, and I took some pictures. And I still have them today, and I look at it, and I, I say, Dad, I can't wait to see you in glory, okay? But, but what, I, what I'm saying to you, beloved, was it still a picture? Was it my dad? Yes, it was. But it was my dead father. Not my living father. It was a picture of my dead father. A lot of people have faith, but it's not a living faith. What is it? It's a dead faith. It's a faithless faith. And faithless faith makes you a self-deceiver. Now, beloved, I want you to look at verse 23 again. 23c. He says, He is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a mirror. Now, note that word, beholding. Katanaeo. And it means to be like the person who's in a hurry or is in a rush, beloved go someplace. So, you know, you've seen them, they, they, they're in the rush to go, and they look, and there's a mirror there, and they go, and they take a cursory and fleeting and glancing look in the mirror, and then they, whoosh, they rush off. Whoosh. They didn't stop to linger there, to stay, hey, do I need to comb my hair? Do I need to fix my tie? Do I need to do this? Do I need to do that? No, they take a quick look into the Word. Oh, yeah, it does said that. Pastor just read it to me. Pastor just preached to me. See you later. See, that's what he's talking about, holding their natural face in a glass, beloved. But they don't linger there. They just take a quick look and they briefly just dash off. So this shows this, at least, beloved, and I'm thankful for this. 
that the self-deceiver at least has some consideration for the soul and the word of God, but not enough. He has not enough consideration, not enough faith, not enough time to pause at God's moral and spiritual mirror long enough to see his own moral and spiritual reflection and condition and obey the principles to try to correct the problems so he can forever change his life. So he'll pause and look, but he won't pause and stay. He's a beholder. Now get this, beloved. It is not enough just to come to church and listen to this preacher. Beloved, I can't believe all of the, I really can't, how this little preacher, who was a nobody, everybody in their brother called me, theologians, everybody calls me, pastors call me, some good, some bad, okay. But I can tell you this, it is not enough just to come to church and hear the word of God. There's a reason for church. This is God's spiritual laboratory where he does his, his uh, work on us. It is not a museum uh, where you come and gawk at people who are already perfected. It's a spiritual hospital where God's going to start digging some things out of you and mending you and apply the healing balm of Gilead to you so you can be more moral, more spiritual, more Christ-like in your life. Amen? That's what church is all about. Sometimes you're going to get mad at the preacher. I don't know why, because I'm such a good fellow anyway. I wouldn't get mad at me. I get mad at me all the time, the fact of the matter is. The wrong decisions that I make sometimes. But beloved, it's not enough for you just to believe the Word of God, or read and study the Word of God, or teach the Word of God, or preach the Word of God, beloved. You must also be a doer of the Word of God if you want to be saved. If you don't, you're just a self-deceiver who hears the Word of God, who agrees with the Word of God, but will not put it into practice in their life. And they are what? Self-deceivers. They equate coming to church, hearing the word, reading the word, studying the word, but not doing the word. They equate all that with salvation, and that's not true. That's like saying you read all about the Patriots or the, uh, or the Red Sox, how to field the ball, how to throw it across home plate, how, you know, what a foul ball is, how many distances. The ball. But yet you've never been out on the field to start practicing and taking your lumps and bruises and all, and all that work and energy that goes into it. Amen? And it goes to show you how of our brains, how Satan is so real and gives us exactly what we want to hear. So you listen to me, beloved. Listen to me, self-deceivers out there. Don't you ever let your heart grow so cold, so hard, so calloused that it seems to protest when you hear something like this being preached to you. That it seems to object. I don't want to hear this. Who does he think he is? Beloved, in the day of judgment, you know what you're going to say when the, past, when the Lord says, Pastor Joel, come over here. <clears throat> yes, sir. <laughs> I mean, yes, sir. You're going to say, he was my best friend. That guy didn't hold anything back. He told me exactly what God said in the Word of God. Now, not that I'm looking for any kudos, beloved. That's not the point. The point is, I'd rather preach other things. <laughs> but I'm preaching what's needful and what the Spirit of God has led me to preach. And when I say me, any good, sin-hating, devil-stomping, pulpit, window-rattling, shingle-pulling, blood-bought, born-again Judeo-Christian <laughs> does. Right? The way preachers used to preach, not anymore. We don't have too many preachers today. We've all become teachers now, lecturers, sermons. We want to appeal to the mind like Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, you know, philosophers. It's amazing, beloved. But you listen to me. You let your heart callous, you know what's going to happen to you? I'll tell you, you're going to lie to yourself. You're going to deceive yourself. You're going to betray yourself, ladies and gentlemen, and it will lead you astray and away from God, and someday, God forbid, God forbid, you will split hell wide open. So what am I saying to you? That's number one. Uh, I, I mean, that's two and three. They do hear, they heed, but I want you to see they heartily dismiss the word, and I may add warning also. Look what he says in verse 24. For he beholdeth himself, and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. Now, now, beloved, they don't and won't let the seed of the word of God come into their heart. They won't do it. Why? Because of our own selfishness. We want to do what we want to do, and that's the bottom line, isn't it? Do I believe in God? Yes. <laughs> do I believe this is the Bible? Yes. 
I submit and surrender to it. You see, beloved, what am I saying to you? I'm saying that self-deceivers have a real warped sense of salvation and too high of an opinion of themselves. And regarding salvation, they trust in what they think and what they feel and what they want to be true, beloved, and not in what the Bible actually says is true. This is the way I want it to be. This is the way I hope it will be. This is the way I feel it should be. But that's not the way it will be. Amen? That's why this is called the canon, the canon. The canon of Scripture. It means the measuring rod, the ruler. What do you do with a ruler? You measure things. And so God has given us the canon, the canon. Not the cannon that you fire or shoot with, ladies and gentlemen. But you see, what I'm saying is it's all just a deadly illusion and delusion in their sinful, faithless hearts and in their fallen minds. And if they do not correct it, it will ultimately cost them their souls. And Lord knows I hate saying things like that. But that's just the fact, beloved. That's just the way it is. But I want you to notice here, after briefly beholding themselves in the mirror of God's word, the Bible says he immediately goes his way because he doesn't like what he sees. In other words, God's mirror of truth discloses his faithless faith. God's mirror of truth exposes his sin and sinfulness. It points out his moral and spiritual flaws and faults and foibles. God's mirror of truth, beloved, clearly shows him how unholy or ungodly or unrighteous he may be. Why? It is not to condemn him. See, we're already condemned. God's trying to save us. Why does God do that, beloved? Why does God want us to look into this? Because he wants to protect us, and he wants to correct us. He wants to protect us from ourself and our self-deception. He wants to protect us from the consequences of sin and be able to uh, recover ourselves from the snare of the devil. And the Bible says who are taken captive by him at his will. That's the purpose of it, to correct and protect, not to condemn. God doesn't want to condemn. The Bible says, beloved, listen to me, it is God's strange work to condemn and judge people. God doesn't like to do that, but he has to because he's absolutely perfect and righteous. And so that's why he gives us this, this book, beloved. Well, what's their problem? The problem is this. When hearers or self-deceivers look at the Word of God, beloved, they don't look at it through the spiritual lens of what the Word of God actually says. They look at through it through their, through their own myopic uh, personal lens of what they want the Word of God to say. And so, therefore, they misinterpret what God says. They think that what God is trying to do is constrain and restrain them from having fun in their life and freedom in their life when God is trying to keep us out of the bondages that condemn us to hell. That's what God is trying to do. Amen? But the self-deceiver does not understand that. Why? Because he doesn't have a spiritual mind yet. He has a carnal mind. And the carnal mind is enmity against God. It is not subject to the law of God. Neither indeed can be. That's what Romans 8, 7 says. See, that's what a carnal mind is. And we need to understand that, beloved. So this type of person, beloved, doesn't like what he sees in the mirror. He beholds himself. I don't like that reflection. I don't like the things that are appearing to me. I don't like what God is pointing out. Why, I'll just leave here right now quickly, and I'll forget all about it. And then surely that'll go away. It won't go away. In fact, beloved, the more you hear the Word of God, is this true? Tell me, you who know the Bible. The more you read and study the Word of God, the more accountable you are to the Word of God. You have to do something. It's like the name Jesus. <laughs> you have to do something to the name of Jesus. Would you say amen out there? But notice it says, he forgetteth what manner of man he was. I won't give you the whole Greek phrase, beloved, but it means he soon forgets. In other words, what he does, beloved, God tries to show him what he's like. He sees his immorality. He sees his unfaithfulness or whatever it may be, uh, his unrighteousness. But hey, look, uh, that thing just gets me depressed. I'm not even going to read that anymore. I'm not even going to look into it anymore. So he goes his way, forgetting that God says, you're damned if you don't repent. You're damned if you don't get your life straight. You're damned if you don't stop. He tries to forget that. Instead of thinking, I'm having fun out there in the world. I'm doing what I want to do. I'm fulfilling my dreams. You see, beloved, that's self-deception, isn't it? Listen, you can still fulfill your dreams. Anybody who knows me, and you know this true, I've been in front of you for almost 40 years now as a minister. Do I have fun? 
I'm always raising Cain. I love to have fun. I, I got my sense of humor from my father. Nobody made me laugh more than my old man. <laughs> and they look at me and say, love is your punk called and it's your vantage. Give you a back end of, you know, stop laughing. But beloved, I don't have to do all the other things to have fun. I find fun. I love life. You know, I try to live the abundant life. Christ came to give us life and that more abundantly in John 10.10. 10. There's a lot of things I don't like about life. But the fact of the matter is, this is the only shot I have at it. You too. Amen? And living life to the fullest doesn't mean going out there and doing everything you want to do, and regardless of the consequences. It means doing what you're supposed to do and having fun doing it. Come on and say amen out there. So, beloved, this person goes his way and immediately tries to forget. He tries to overlook. He tries to dismiss when he sees God's word and warning show him. And so he's a forgetter. So that's point number one, the character of self-deceiving. Now you say, Pastor, you got two more points? Yeah, and sub-points too, but I'll make them quick. I promise you. I want you to see the condemnation of self-deceivers. Look what he says in verse 14. He says, but every man, how many men? A few men. Just a, occasional men. Just some men. No. But every man is tempted when he's drawn away with his own lust and enticed. Now watch what he says. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin when it is finished bringeth forth death. And then he says, Do not err, my beloved brethren. Now, ladies and gentlemen, James 4, 4 says this, Whosoever is a friend of the world is an enemy of God. Now imagine, if you're a friend of the world, I don't mean the creation, I mean the world system. God says you're an enemy, you're my enemy. But the self-deceiver says this. He says, surely I'm a friend of God. I can't be an enemy of God. Why, you see, I'm a good person. You, you see, I try to come to church when I can. I try to sing in the choir. I'm a good person. I try to teach a Bible study. I try to teach Sabbath school. Stop trying and start doing it right. Well, you good night. <laughs> He, he, he said, I try, I, 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 I listen to the sermon, and listen, Lord, I'm your friend, I'm not as bad as some other Christians are. You ever hear that excuse? Never. Right? So what if I'm not obedient, that obedient to you all the time, Lord? So what if I'm not that faithful or, or, or uh, committed to you all the time, Lord? At least you know that I believe in Jesus, and that's all that counts, right? You see, I've been hearing all about him. I believe it. I've sat in church. I've seen pastor jump up and down and scream and spit and shout. And I, 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 I've heard it. I've heard all of that, and I agree with it. I just haven't done anything about it. Now, what's his problem? How his problem is, you listen to me, God knows that if he doesn't have your heart, he doesn't have your life. And if he doesn't have your heart and life, you do not have his heart and his life. And consequently, nothing but eternal condemnation awaits self-deceivers or only hearers of the word of God and not doers of it. Why? Because they still love their sin and the world much more than they love their Savior and salvation and going to heaven. Now note these four quick facts, beloved. Number one, look at verse 14. Sin allures them. But every man is tempted when he's drawn away with his own lust and enticed. In other words, sinful enticements and temptations still appeal to his own lustful heart and draws him away from God. So he's no friend of God. Number two, sin not only allures them. Look at verse 15a. Sin impures them. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. In other words, beloved, what was he saying? Notice they produce corrupt fruit in their life. Why? Because of their moral and spiritual impurity and impiety that originates from their own lustful heart that refuses to get right with God by obeying His commandments. So they're no friend of God either, amen? Not only does sin allure them and impure them, but know that sin unmoors them. Look what he says in verse 15b. He says, And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. In other words, beloved, it cuts them off from God and from His salvation. Those of you who have ever had a boat, you know what I'm talking about. In fact, Hebrews chapter 2, verses 1 through 3 speak about it, but I don't have time, so I just want to explain this quickly to you. I've used this illustration before, but this is the truth. One day, my friends and I, we were out clamming off Brown's Bank out here. And if you've ever been out to Brown's Bank out here, 
you know the tides come and go. And I used to love to swim. I loved to dive. All of that, beloved. But this was a particularly low tide, and you had to get there before the seagulls did because when the tide would go up, they were stranded way out there. And the seagulls would come, and the, 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 the sea clams would be right on the top. And you basically just pick them up, put them in a bucket, or put them in a bag before the seagulls got there. So we got there, and all around, we're like on a little island surrounded with water. And I said to my buddy, I said, let's carry it and put, let's carry the boat. And let's put it right in the middle of this little island. Now, nah, don't worry about it. Just throw the anchor out. I said, okay. So I look, and we're busy picking. I mean, we had sacks of clams. I mean, you know, <laughs> trying to drag them to the boat. And then I looked, and the boat's floating. And it's, I can't even see the rope. And the tide's coming in. It's all around us. He says to me, he says, JB, he says, go get the boat. I said, you go get it. <laughs> He says, go get the boat. We don't want to lose the clams. I said, you want to lose the clams or lose your life? <laughs> so I dive in the water, and I'm swimming out there. You know, I'm trying to reach that boat, but the current's what? I'm drifting farther and farther and farther. You know what I finally had to do? I dove down under the water, and I grabbed the rope where the anchor was on it, and I started what? Pulling myself up because it was dragging the rope, and so it gave me some, you know, distance. It closed the distance for me, so to speak. But that's what it does. It cuts us off from God. Beloved, the Bible says in Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death, eternal death, spiritual death. And so notice the final or the finality of the penalty of their sin or disobedience is eternal separation from God and a place known as the lake of fire, which the Bible says is the second death. So what are you saying to me, Pastor? I'm saying that's too high a price to pay for self-deception. So people who do this are no friend of God. But also, beloved, sin not only allures them and impures them and immures them, but notice it obscures them. Look what he says in verse 16. Do not err, my beloved brethren. In other words, beloved, when you err, it means you either can't see it or you refuse to see something. You see, beloved, as with Samson and Delilah. Samson was a Nazarite. He knew that he should not be with Delilah. And I've preached to this before, beloved. When he had his eyes gouged out, it's because sin can bind you. Sin can blind you. And sin can grind you, just like it did to Samson when he was thrown down into the Philistine grinding mill, blinded, haircut. Got a haircut in the devil's barbershop, grinding and grinding away, blind as a bat. Sin blinds us, and binds us, and it grinds us. Amen. And yet, People still love to err. Why? Because they lie to themselves. And they say, God's still pleased with me. You see, I've, I heard Pastor Joel today, and I, I read the Bible. I read right along with him. But, you know, it's time to dee dee right now. My, my roast is in the oven. There's things i got to do. And then they forget everything they heard because they've been in self-deception. Amen? And ultimately, they're condemned. My last point, the cure for self-deception. Look what he says in verse 25. He says, but whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he or she, being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man, that is who does this, shall be blessed in his deed. In other words, instead of just taking a quick glance into the mirror of God's perfect law of liberty, beloved, what they really need to do is to stop and take a deep look into it. Amen? Now the word looketh here, parakupto, it means to do this. Listen, it means to, now look at me. It means to stop, stoop, and bend over, and gaze into something. Okay? So you stop. Let me take a little bit closer look here. And you stoop, and you bend over, and you look in. That's what that word, that Greek word means. This is what the doer does, beloved. He stops, and he stoops over the word of God, and he spends a lot of time, a great deal of time looking into it. Why in the world does he not do that? Trying to carefully and judicially please God, inspect the Word of God, thoughtfully and thoroughly, beloved, examine the Word of God so he can personally and regularly apply it to his life and he can become moral, spiritual, just like his Savior, Jesus Christ, and enter into the uh, glories of heaven someday. Would you say amen out there? But I want you to note the contrast here. The self-deceivers in verse 24 only quickly beholds God's mirror and then he immediately walks away unchanged and he's unsaved. 
Whereas the doer, in verse 25, regularly and habitually looks into it. And he constantly and continuously stares and glares into it, and he gawks and gazes into it, and he dives and he delves and he digs into it. Daily apply it to his life, and consequently, we haven't got time to read it, but verse 21 and verse 25 says he is both now saved and blessed by God because of this implanted seed of the word of God in him. He's a doer of the perfect law of liberty, and it has supernaturally changed his life and his mind. Would you say amen out there? You see, beloved, he's set free from the penalty of sin now. He's set free from the power and the passion of sin, of the pull of sin, and thank God from the pain of sin. Amen? And someday the Bible says, from the very presence of sin itself, but at least the minimum, beloved, we're set free from this present evil world system that doesn't ensnare you. I can't even watch the news. It drives me crazy. People have shelved their brains. They're, they're, they're subliminally trying to hypnotize you, and your subconscious mind that doesn't think just stores the information, just kind of picks it up. And people are saying, you see that? You see what they had to say right here? No facts, no evidence. You know, accusations tantamount to conviction today. That's all you need. And you try it on the court of public opinion. Amen? So what does he have to do, beloved, to fix his problem? Three things. You say, you're going to do a quick passer. Didn't I tell you that? You think I'd lie to you? Honestly, I wouldn't do that. <laughs> Number one, beloved, he needs to repent of their works. Look at verse 21a. He needs to repent, bottom line. Wherefore, lay apart all your immorality, your filthiness, and your superabundance of naughtiness, and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your soul. Notice, beloved, they need to come to their senses and turn away from their self-deception. And the Bible says lay aside. You know what that means? Look at me. It means to go like this. To take off your dirty, old, filthy garments. To take it off. Just take off, like you take off your dirty clothes and set them aside. God says, that's what you need to do. Repent, lay it aside. Lay aside your sin. Lay aside your immorality. Lay aside your fornication. Lay aside your self-deception. Lay it aside. Take it off like dirty clothes. Number two, I want you to see that God says, when you lay that aside and put on God's robes of righteousness, you need to, number two, receive the word. Look what he says in verse 21b. He says, beloved, that, uh, that you receive with meekness or humility the engrafted word which is able to save your soul. Now, the word receive is the Greek word dekomai. It means to humbly, reverently embrace, obey, and apply God's implanted seed of the word of God to your life. When Peter, in the Petrine epistles, when he was writing to his readers, he said this in, in uh, 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 2. He said, desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. 3.18, he says, and grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Don't groan in disgrace, but grow in what? Grace. How do I do it, Peter? Through the sincere milk of the Word of God. Mother's milk is one of the perfect food. In fact, one of the highest sources of lauric acid you can ever get except for raw coconut. But can you imagine, beloved, that child grows up having mom, mama's milk. God says, I want you to have Abba's milk. What's that? It's the Word of God. So he receives the word. And lastly, beloved, he reviews the word. Verse 25. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hero of the work, this man, this man shall be blessed in his deed. What's he saying? He seemed that he needed to daily look into the perfect law of liberty. They need to daily continue in the perfect law of liberty. They need to daily remember the perfect law of liberty. They need to continually do the perfect law of liberty and let God save them and set them free. Amen? The music book of Israel is the Psalms, the Psalter. The very first Psalm, Psalm chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, the Bible says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. Verse 2. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. Years later, King David said in Psalm 1, 97, he says, Oh, how I love thy law. It is my meditation all the day long. Oh, I love it more than life, he said. I love it more than anything. I love, he says, coming into the house of God so I can meet with God and understand God. So my question to you this morning is this. 
Are you a spiritual doer of the Word of God who will be blessed and saved? Or are you a self-deceiver who is a liar and ultimately will be lost if you don't correct it? Are you a self-deceiver? Let's go to the throne of grace. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the mirror of the word.